Well, hello there. Welcome to Alice in Wonderland. Thank you for joining us this fine evening. Uh, I'm very excited that you are here because tonight I get to introduce you to the one, the only, Rick Zeef. Rick Zeef is an amazing Emmy-nominated voice actor as well as a voice director and casting director. He's been working in the animation business for over 25 years, and he is one cool dude. Uh, Rick is probably one of my favorite actors to do the voice acting thing with, and um, we're going to have him live on the show. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Hey, Voice Chasers. Hey, Tyler Dog. Good to see you again. Um, yes, for anybody, uh, we're just waiting for um, Rick to tune in. He'll be here just momentarily. Hey, James, it's good to see you. Is everybody having a good week? Jeff, it wouldn't be Allison's Wonderland without you. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, Real Magic TV, thank you for tuning in. Hey, Melissa, it's good to see you as well. Um, go Patriots. I didn't check the score. I don't think we, I think we won. Um, but yeah, let me just double check with Rick that he has um, the right information because I don't see him on the screen right now. So, so bear with me one minute. You guys missed my little masterpiece theater intro that I tried to do from my from my memory. Um, yes, thanks for bearing with me. Um, how's everybody doing today? You love my hair? I think I got a haircut. Don't worry, I wore a mask. Um, so yeah, a little bit more about Rick. Um, Rick and I met working on a show called The Mr. Men Show, which was my very first animated series that I did in 2008. And uh, Rick was at Renegade Animation, and here he is. And um, Rick uh, is going to tell you all about it. So hold on, let me go ahead and add him to the stream. Ask to join, and then you can go ahead and accept it. Hi. Wow, that's really close up. I did say it, but it does come in very close for some reason. You get your angles, and then it's like, whoa, hey, I'm back. Yeah. The microphone. Wow, I'll go back here. How are you? I'm great. Hey, James Harrow, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Art is also from New England. Um, my friend Ghetto Fabulous, who's on the stream, is also from New England. And fun fact, Rick Zeep, where are you from? I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Yay! Yes. Little known fact. I've been working hard to hide the accent, and now I get these jobs where they want a Boston accent, and I get very confused. Hmm. But I'm, uh, I'm from the suburbs of Boston. What part? What part? Well, I grew up in Natick. Natick. Out near Framingham. Yeah. You know, where sometimes it gets wicked hot in the summer. Of course. You know, it's impossible to park anywhere. Um, yeah, Framingham, Natick, and then we moved to, like, closer to Boston to, to a town called Weston, a very tiny little pilgrimy town. Yes, Rick Z, voice of reason, says actor Will Roberts. <laughs> hey, hey, thanks, actor Will Roberts. Have Glad you're on board. Tonight. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. I grew up in Massachusetts, too. I grew up in Hanson, a small town called Hanson. I know. Hanson, is that a little further out west? Uh, it's south. It's in Plymouth. South. County. Oh, Plymouth County. Okay, yeah. near Buzzards Bay in that area. Yeah, you know, Buzzards Bay is a little bit farther, but, you know, we'll take it. <laughs> Be happy for that. Wow. Better than I'll can you can, first of all? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm I'm not the Mister Technological guy. Can you hear me? You want me to goose up anything? I hear you great, and I see you great. Wow! Wow! You look yeah, great. A, Are this you is extreme close that? up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this is a booth, mm -hmm. and I'm just sitting in front of a booth because I thought a solid background um, would, uh, you know, make me look really thin. I I don't know. I don't know why. I it's I'm just here. There's a light, and my my uh, tripod was here, so I was very proud of myself. It kind of looks like you created a green screen from your beard. That's what. It, that's the whole look. Yep. All goes my face really starts here. <laughs> <laughs> Happy November! Will you be celebrating November? Uh, I kind of always do, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I I've had this beard since you know a long, long time ago. I love this. I see hearts fluttering. Yes. Uh, people are saying hi. This Hope is very Levy exciting. Is on another voice actress is on. The oh, show. yeah. She's no, going to be coming on the show in the next couple months. Hopefully. I'm going to wipe my lens so you can see me. Is that where my lens is? Can you see me? I don't we know where my lens. Yeah. This is. I have to wipe my face. There you go. <laughs> got my 
shout out for Batman. It's my Batman lens cloth cleaner. Hey, did you do some Batman stuff? I did um, a really fun job. Uh, yes, Adam West's last job it was a pinball, not a video game, but a uh, video game. Uh, a pinball old school for the 60th anniversary of the real Batman. We got the real Batman, the real Robin. And if you remember the old wow. Batman series from those old days, there was always this kind of goofy announcer narrator guy. And I um, apparently sound somewhat like him. And it was just really fun. And um, I was there for the swag. I got a Batman jacket and a Batman lens cloth. So that's my favorite. Wow. Swag is always the cool stuff that we love, like the dolls and the mugs, like pay me what you can, but give me a mug or a pencil. I know you can like see my like Mr. Men wow. slash Yokai Watch collection over there in the corner. So I totally hear you. I have candy nice. from like you know six years ago that I won't allow my child to open. <laughs> and so she's always like, "Can I take this out of the box?" And like, no, absolutely not. No way. That's so awesome. Oh, we love have some the merch. Jerry fans on the show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Love that. Couple fans. So, uh, Rick, we know that you are um, an Emmy-nominated voice actor, which, you know, I got to say, especially considering um, there's not multiple awards for voice acting. Uh, the, they give out one, and you right. have to be nominated. It's not, there's not separate categories for men and women. There's just, is it three? No. It five? It's five. Five, right? It was five, yeah, and I, I was staggered and and so surprised. It was both men and women, and it was, you yeah. know, um, let's just say very, you know, it was like Kelsey Grammer, Kate McKinnon. It was like all these celebrities, and at the very bottom, there's this this other dude, and it was uh, it was very awesome and exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I think they should separate categories, but anyway, it was it was Cinderella time to be able to, you know, put on a tux and 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 meet people and have a blah. Just a big honor for me, so I'm thrilled. Who did you go with? Did you take your wife? I took my wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife and I took lots of pictures and hung out there. And uh, uh, it was just exciting. It's funny. Um, you know, I'm the biggest hypocrite. Like, growing up as a young actor, you know, you'd watch the Tonys, you'd watch the Oscars. And part of you wants to be up on that stage someday. But I'd, I'd always be like, it's all about the work, you know? <laughs> I have my own trophy in my own heart, you know? I don't need a trophy room. <laughs> and then as soon as you get the, you know, nomination, it's like, they're still on the phone and I'm getting the tux fitting and I'm like, Mr. Hypocrite, how many parties can I say yes to? Yes. So um, I'm a big phony. It was fun, um, but you know, it is it is truly about the work. Being recognized is is great, but I think being actors, as you and I have been for a long time, me a lot longer, but, um, it is about the work, but we do love a little bit of feedback. You know, sometimes you feel like you're in a vacuum and uh, that polite nod that my work was worthy uh, was very exciting. Yay, that's amazing. <laughs> um, did you care to do Spike? Sorry. Hey, got that, could you hear me at all? I'm maybe very loud. He's yeah, a very loud voice. You. Every engineer says, please move to the other room. You know, move away from the microphone. But Allison, I'm so glad to be here to talk to all your fans out there. He's just talking like this. That's that Spike. Oh, that's so fun. And you did, uh, you, you've done some other characters on the show as well, right? Yeah, you know, they reach out whenever there's a, a new or an ancillary character, they throw them at me, the French guy, the this guy, the nerdy guy, the hotel, whatever, whenever there's an episode and I'm, I'm in it, or sometimes even if I'm not in it as Spike, they will throw some fun stuff at me. It's, it's been a great ride. We're in our sixth season and it's just one of those insane gifts. You know, you hope that something can last a season. You hope yeah. you can get a few episodes. Um, or when you're a guest on a show, you think, oh, could he come back? There's no toe tag on him. He might still be alive. Um, and you think maybe he'll come back for another episode. And I literally have been so lucky uh, to do episodes. You too have been part of the show for a long time and have done a good chunk of episodes. So having a character that starts to fit you like an old glove is just, mm -hmm. it's so great to just see how the characters grow and develop in different circumstances. Um, and of course the people that we work with, um, it's renegade through Warner Brothers that are just so warm and so amazing. And um, it's, it's a great, it's a, the best job I've ever had that particular Aww. one. 
That's you know? amazing. It's one of the many greatest jobs I've ever had. I guess I want to be inclusive of every job that anytime someone said, you're the guy, uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative. Yeah. Yeah. It's like asking about which is your favorite child. That's right. Although in That's... our cases, we both only have one child. So it's very clear. <laughs> right. Which one. And she is, she is neck and neck for my favorite, my child. So, no. <laughs> you know, actually, so I don't know if our, our viewers know, but your daughter is actually a voice actress as well. I have to give a shout out to my daughter, Katie Zeef, who uh, has been doing voiceovers since before she could even read. <laughs> um, I used to have to go into the booth with her and say the line to her so she would know what the line is and then she would say it. Um, she um, got to do a, a really adorable series uh, with, called Little Angels. It was little brother and sister. <clears throat> and she did um, just a fabulous job. She was maybe six years old. Um, and that actually came about funny story. Um, I was working on a show um, on Nickelodeon called um, Olivia, based on the book series uh, of the little pig character of Olivia. Yeah. And, I, and I got to play the dad character. And my daughter okay. and wife, bless you, Thank came you. by to um, just kind of observe the session. They let them watch and hang out. And at the end, I said, would you mind if I just took a picture of my daughter in the booth with the big headphones, because her head's like this big and the headphones were this big. And um, we put her in there. She looked all adorable and she put on these huge headphones. And uh, I said to the director, just have her say something. I'm gonna videotape her saying something. And she said something painfully cute. And the director said, have her say this. And have her improvise about her favorite crayon colors or whatever. And she goes off and my kid is very funny and as outspoken as I am. And the next thing you know, she was one of the school kids in Olivia. And because of that, uh, one of those same writers was writing this other show for Little Angels and she got to play the lead in the series at quite a young age and has stayed with it uh, all the way through. Uh, she was a recurring role on Sophia the First as a little oh. British sorceress and she got to sing songs. Just about two weeks ago, it was Halloween time and one of the songs she sang was a special Halloween episode song. And just for fun, we went on to Google or Spotify to see how many times it had been listened to or downloaded. She was like, Dad, my song's been listened to a half a million times. And I'm like, I'm coming to you for work. Are you kidding? What? That's amazing. <laughs> Where is Miss Katie now? Miss Katie's in the next room, probably doing homework or hiding from this whole oh, event of Dad could, being like, like drag her on and be like, give a cameo, Katie. <laughs> she, she would have to go through the works first, I think. Uh, <laughs> the hair and makeup trailers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're in we're in a gauntlet right now of uh, my daughter's a high school senior and she is looking for colleges and doing all her essays and deadlines and it's a it's a pretty crazy time around here it's, a, it's and, a tough time to do that too because you can't actually visit the schools can you no they're all virtual tourists mm -hmm. we've we've toured many 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 schools and um interviewed with some admissions people and she's looking at acting programs on on all in all areas and she's very open to different cities and, and different programs and it's exciting it's um i know with your little one you feel like oh time's going so quickly <laughs> you know you'll blink and you'll be doing this college thing saying wait a minute you know it's it's wild it's yeah, really wild but. i know well the first few years go uh excruciatingly slow uh, and it's <laughs> like why do people say this flies by this is torturously slow um why can't you eat solid food and then um yeah and then i think around three it really has sped up and um now yeah. he's so cute i'm like donate another day yay that's um, great a lot of people asking what your inspiration was for spike how you were able to do the voice of spike so i know you just did the voice for us but can you talk a little bit yeah. about you know you got the audition how did that all come about well it, it's interesting because i, I think as actors, we gravitate nash, uh, naturally to originating role. Like when we, when you and I worked on the Mr. Men show, yeah. we, we weren't doing sound alike. So this was a, a new show that had very colorful characters. You're, you were so good on that show. I just want to give you the yeah. shout out. So amazing. And, um, uh, but it was curious with this sort of, you know, legacy character, if you will, mm -hmm. there were many who had done the role before. So the edict was to, 
honor that and listen to the old voices that were doing it and then sort of to put my spin on it and um I my inspiration honestly was an imitation of an imitation for the most part. My dad was a big fan of Jimmy Durante, who was an actor back in the day, mm -hmm. and he had that really kind of weird rhythm with the, you know. And my father loved to imitate that, and so I was doing an imitation of an imitation, and that's that's an homage for pop for the most part. That's interesting because I would say that your spike has a lot of heart to it. And I, I can see that it, it, it has this connection that moves you not just on a comic level, but on a, a, a <laughs> level of emotion. It's interesting that. I am so delighted that you somehow, like, we'd even pick that up. Here's why. You know, as written, he's this very gruff and, you know, I'm going to give you a knuckle sandwich kind of guy. But um, I am, like, the biggest, you know, mushy family teddy bear kind of guy yeah. and um i wanted to bring i didn't know any better than to bring that heart to him but i wanted him to have that heart and um there are episodes with his son tyke that are my favorite because he is the most doting dad uh in fact um one actor trick that a lot of us use is we have like a key phrase that we'll use to log us into the character so to speak mm -hmm. um and sometimes uh, for your viewers who are actors, you know, if you do a cartoon, you better sound the same in episode 41 that you did in episode three. So staying consistent is a very, very important part of that game. Uh, and there may be long lapses of time. You might do a video game and, and part two of the video game or the sequel is three years later. So being able to be consistent is important. So for, for that and some of my characters, I very privately have key phrases mm -hmm. that I say that log me into not only the vocal essence of the character, but the emotional core of the character. And for Spike, and I won't share them all with you, but I'll share that one mm -hmm. with you. Um, I, I literally, it's two words. And my, for all of Spike and all of his anger and blah, 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 this is my key phrase to log me into character. Taiki boy. Mm -hmm. That's it. Taiki boy. And and the, the people, you know, at the studio get a kick out of it because every dozen lines or, or so, I'll lean away from Mike and just go, Taiki boy. So he's gruff, he's big, he's burly, but he's got a soft core and he is um, very loving. And I love, I mean, that it, that you noticed it or felt it. I mean, that's a very important part of the character for me. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, do you remember the first time we ever met? <laughs> Do you remember the first time we ever met? Um, I would have said it was on the Mr. Men show, and I'm guessing that's wrong. No, I, I'm pretty sure. I, I mean, I was curious because I, I have general memories of the first sessions that we had. Um, so yeah. for those at, um, that might not be familiar, there was a show called the Mr. Men show, which was on Cartoon <sighs> Network. We did two <sighs> seasons around 2008. And um, so it was the iconic characters. Actually, I can show you guys. Like Little it was Miss Sunshine great. and Little Miss Naughty and Little Miss Lips. <laughs> and Rick, who did you play? Which were your characters? Uh, I played Mr. Nervous, which still is one of my favorite characters of, of, that I've ever done. I just had such a ball. And I also played um, Mr. Nosy. Oh, so those are my two characters. Can you do uh, Mr. Nosy Bird? Uh, Mr. Nosey, this kind of was very nasal. Mr. Nosey, he was always paired with Mr. Small. And Mr. <laughs> Small was like, Nose, we're going to do this. And I'm like, no, okay. He wasn't the Richard sharpest Eckhart? nostril on the face. That was Phil Lawler, Phil Lawler. played Mr. Small. Yes. And he was like, Nose, we're going to do this. He had this sort of regal thing. Mm -hmm. And I was always the big, dumb kind of follower. I had a ball with that. Um, Mr. Nervous just has remained like a, a staple and a go-to he was just utterly nervous about everything and i i loved doing him a lot yeah that was so fun how did you end up um working on that show how did was that an audition you got through an agent or someone i got that audition through my agent and the, another for anybody who's pursuing acting out there i know probably a lot of your followers are, are actors as well and yeah. stick with it stick with it um I had a very lengthy TV and film career before I went into animation yeah. and people are surprised to find out how late in the game I was before I moved over to video games and animation. And Party um, five, what, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, 45, mm -hmm. a few. Um, someone IMDb'd me. Um, <laughs> so I, um, when the audition came, they listed all of the characters. And they said, audition for any one of these that you want. And, you know, I was so industrious and so driven um, that I think at the time, I want to say there were something like 17 male characters on the list. I don't know if they ultimately were all used, you know, because it was Mr. Nervous, Mr. You know, they probably had the, the ones that got pushed to the side, you know, Mr. Sloven, Slovenly, Mr. You know, Bacon. I don't know what they, what the offshoots were, but I did, I did all 17 characters with three varying takes for each one. I sent in 51 auditions. Is that the right math? Let's go with that. What, how long did that take you to? Like it was a whole weekend. I just, I locked myself away for like two and a half days wow. and I sent in a file, a very big file of all these characters and, and those, I was delighted to get those too. Um, and so, I don't know. I, I think that that enterprising spirit either completely turned them on or made them very frightened. I, I'm not sure, but I'll say it paid off. Or he's gonna it snow. paid off. And I, and I will say that I think that's where we did meet because I remember our first conversation, somehow we came up with a Boston thing. You had just left, you were, came from Emerson yeah. and mm -hmm. you were fairly new and we had this Boston connection. And, um, I, and then I remember one of the head writers was also a Boston person. And um, I think we had this whole Boston. Actually, it's yeah. Eric Casimiro. Eric is from Eric is from um, a, a town very close to where I'm from, Marshfield, Massachusetts. Oh, oh Marshfield! And, wow. Uh, Kate's actually from Maine, but still New England. Wow, if New England. My New England peeps are still on this. this right. Thing. Well, we we met there, and um, what was great, and and I, I hope you'll agree with me that the best part of the the doing of the show the being in the show and character work is a blast but doing it what we'll call radio play style where we're in a booth with multiple actors at the same time mm -hmm. so you are not just acting but you're reacting you're actually playing whole scenes um some of the people who are new to animation or not in the business might not realize for a lot of our shows you go in, you read your lines and you leave and then the next person reads their lines and later they they lace them all together for dialogue, but we got to actually riff, and that was the best part. I know. I mean, you think about it. Yep, Jeff, the token New Yorker. You think about it, and um, it's not the most, it's not the least expensive way to do it because you're keeping everybody right. there for the same amount of time, and you need more microphones. Um, but it, you create this spontaneity that can't quite be, you know, otherwise, your director has to really have a good ear and know oh, we'll, you know, try it like this or have a lot of options so that if somebody delivers their line differently, you have like a backup. Yes. Um, right. Can I give a quick shout out apropos to what we're talking about? Of course. Um, I, um, there's a new game launched. It's called Bug Snacks, B-U-G-S-N-A-X. Yes. Um, I'm doing a live promotional thing tomorrow on Twitch. I sound mm -hmm. so techy. My God. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm twitching tomorrow. Oh. Um and um, it was done radio play style with like a dozen actors at a time. So you talk about production costs. You have 12 people on the payroll plus the whole engineering people and everybody. But we're in a huge circle of microphones. And we would do these lengthy scenes and people were acting and interacting. It was incredibly exciting to do. That is so Bug fun. snacks. Bug snacks. Please yeah. look it up. Let's yeah. talk about bug snacks, actually. Um, so it, I mean, it just came out and I've been watching some of the things. It looks very interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about the game? I can tell you a little bit. A that's, little bit. That's yeah. the operative word there. Um, I'm going to be seeing a lot more of it tomorrow, right before the, the promo thing. Um, it is um, a game that is hilariously funny. So as much action as there is, um, they've really skewed it to comedy, funny characters. And... To piggyback on what you said about the the spike thing, um, there there are a lot of the characters have issues that get worked through. There's a very deep spirit of inclusion and and real real life stuff. There's a big LGBTQ component. I mean, it's it's a very cool show. Yeah. And on top of that, it's hilarious. So I'm proud to be 
part of something that actually um, has not just comedic value and adventure and play game gameplay virtue, but um, I think I think audiences will think this is a really cool and and you know together and today kind of game. Yeah. So um, it's very funny. And who is your character? I play a guy called Chrome Do Face. <laughs> And um, he, uh, yeah. at the risk of being redundant, he's he's sort of a New York-y Danny DeVito, not miles and miles away from Spike, mm -hmm. but um, don't tell you know them that. There might be a sequel to the game. Um, but uh, he's he's a little bit more, you know, uh, you know, he's a little bit slurry, this guy kind of guy. And he's like, you know, we got to get them little bug snacks. They're tasty little treats. And he's a, so he's a little bit more, he's got a different edge than, than Spike. He's not as you know, staccato and punchy that way. Yeah. Not mean at all, but just has more eye rolly sarcastic than, uh -huh. than gut punch mean. That's so funny. And so w will you be posting on your Instagram, the link to Chris? I will. Okay. Now that you've said that, yes, that's I on my to-do list. Where's really that to-do list? Involved. Here it is. <laughs> I've got that to-do list, right? It's right there. Yep. I'm going to do that. You know, I'm you gonna... can also just take somebody's post and then just, you know, share it. <laughs> It's like you like you, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I also realized that um, I talked to them today about this event, and they said if they just Google the word bug snacks, um, there's a lot, there are many, many reviews that come up, and probably we'll have a link to this event tomorrow. It's, it's being done by um, Epic, Epic, the people who do Fortnite. Okay. And it's going to be, uh, it's, it's a mobile thing, but they also do put it, rolling it out PS4, PS5. I'm so techie. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just, just saying all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Do, I mean, you're, you, so I know that you're not a super big social media user. How do you usually connect with your fans? You know, I'm really glad you brought that up. <laughs> tell me, tell me. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with social media, I think, like we all do. Like we all do. Um, and uh, I realize that the vigilance it requires to keep it so active, um, in a lot of ways, and uh, it kind of takes me out of the game a little bit. So I love doing interviews. I love doing promotional events when someone says, be here at such and such a clock yeah. to take a picture of a head of cabbage or, or, you know, or whatever. I just, you know, you brought up earlier. The but nomination. it looks I... like Sting. <laughs> right. It looks like... It's this waffle that looks so. Um, <laughs> um, when I when I was fortunate enough uh, to get that nomination a couple of years ago, um, a dear friend said, you know, you've got to like up your social media game and I'm going to, I'm going to be your guy and we're going to coach you through this and I'm going to get on Instagram. Ooh, and um, so I did the Instagram thing and he's like, you got to post this many times and this often. And every time you're at a gig, you know, backgrounds and it, it was a little dizzying. And I remember saying and thinking and asking people who are very active on social media, do you now, look at your world through the lens of this is a good angle or this is a good shot or oh look at his background and and it started to take me out of my life to think about what sharing that life could be i'm getting deep here um and i and i got burnt out fairly quickly yeah. so um and that and then some weird happened something weird happened with my instagram account some unsavory things ended up there so i just kind of walked away yeah yeah there's a lot Maybe I did, but there were some people with less clothes than I would think would be on my Instagram account. Um, on and, your uh, account or on Somehow your, something, on maybe, your, I don't know how it'll. Your timeline, like you were my following timeline, people? Probably my you? follower. I don't know okay. if they were bots or what they were doing. I don't okay. know. Okay. All I, I know is. I got you. I thought I like, is, you were ended up on your timeline. <laughs> no. I, all I know is this, that it kind of burnt me out to the whole thing. I'm a poster child the antithesis of the poster child for how to do it right. I'd rather, I'm so old school. I'd rather sit and chat with you. Yeah. I'd rather, you know, do interviews and, and it, it, it scares me a little bit and I don't want to go too far down this particular social dilemma. Is that the, the big, yes. the big movie that's out right now yes. that, you know, I, I finally got an audition and tell me if you've gotten one of these where you submit your audition and your social media numbers. That's part of, the thing you submit and i'm like 
aren't I being judged on the merit of my work? I mean, and by the way, I won't tell you what the name of the company was, but it was a massive national company we all know. It wasn't like, we need your social media to get our word or our new product out there. Right. This was a massive company. I'm like, do you care if I have this many followers? Like, oh, suddenly when you start selling your product, you have a few more thousand people to to love it as well. It's it's a little scary to me. And, yeah. um, uh, but I, I will probably reinvestigate using more social media as a tool. I just have to find a balance. And I will ask you, I'll throw this back at you. You do this show, you're very active as an actor, you do a lot of different things, you're a mom. Um, how does social media fit into your the, the puzzle of your world? It's interesting. Um, I think when I first got on social media with like Friendster back in, I don't even know what year, I think I was probably in college, Friendster and then it was, you know, the internet was this cool, weird thing where cool, weird people hung out and I loved it. <laughs> and uh, I moved, I, I was like going into college. I said, I don't even want a computer. Like, ugh. and then I ended up on the digital culture floor with a bunch of tech nerds. And I was like, you guys are amazing. I love this. And I actually ended up majoring in new media. And um, wow. And so I, I was in many ways like an early adopter, but then last year I was trying to focus on writing a feature and I needed to carve out time for it. And I was like, wow. social media, you gotta go. Um, you're, you are like the hand in my puppet. Like you are controlling <laughs> me in ways I can't always figure out. Like if I check it and then I have like general anxiety or, so I, I took a 14 month hardcore break. Getting off was wow. so easy. It was just uh, you know, wow. I would occasionally be like, this is a beautiful moment. I should take a picture and like share it. And what would I, and then I'm like, no, nope, I'm going to keep this moment for myself. And it was a really nice wow. time. But after a certain period of time, I'm like, I feel like a digital nomad. And I very much feel called to bring people together and, um, and be, bring the light. And especially with COVID and everything, I, I decided to get back on in part because Again, I, I felt it had been so long that it's like if a job is booked in the woods and nobody tweets it, do they even yeah. know it exists? I'm like, am I, you know, I, what, is, what is going on with that? Um, so I got back on and, and this has been a nice way to actually connect and um, use my platform to elevate other people and share information that I think is useful. Um, but you are completely right that you do end up viewing your life through the lens of wow how would how would this be consumed instead of how is this experienced um yeah you know it's a catch-22 though <laughs> but i and i get it and i and i love um you know doing events and i and you yeah. do want to be very grateful for the fans that are supportive of your work and want more of it and they enjoy the game or the show or, or whatever so i do actually feel a responsibility weirdly i mean yeah. the fans make us you know and and without them our shows and things wouldn't perpetuate so i i would like to be there when people like find me and write to me and say oh can you write me a letter or can you send this or can you do a thing or um I, i'm always on board. I mean, I just am that grateful. I mean, I think that if, if you were to ask me what I'm most grateful for in this business, um, I, I would just say that I get to do what I love and that I still feel that probably the biggest blessing is when that phone rings and I'm told I'm the one I feel no different at my ripe old age than I did way at the beginning of the game. And, and I wish that on anybody that it's not like, Oh yeah. Okay. We'll fit it in if we can. Um, I'm so delighted, you know, to quote every commercial ever written. I know they have a choice and there are a bunch of guys just as talented. I feel incredibly lucky. <laughs> You're just saying that cause it's true. Um, but, um, but I, I do, I feel really lucky. Um, and mm -hmm. You know, I, I think my wife would tell me that I, 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 I lean on luck too much. That perseverance and and industriousness uh, certainly have had their place in my world. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, when when it comes to like Tom and Jerry, when they were first developing the show, they asked if I would do scratch track, mm -hmm. 
And I thought, well, that's a smart thing to do. You do some temp lines as they develop the scripts and try new scripts and throw out old scripts and get them all sort of ready. Um, mm. They asked me to do that. And I would go out to Glendale and do the scratch. Yeah. And then the next week I would do more scratch thinking they'll get used to hearing me. <laughs> and I did that for about 18 months going out to Glendale recording and recording in hopes that I would just keep putting my, my reel in the water. And 18 months later, when it was time to make the show, I was pretty dismayed to get an email from my agent as I get all my auditions, an invitation to audition to play Spike on Tom and Jerry, knowing by that email, it went to a bazillion people and I, I was crushed. And, uh, but, Anyway, it worked out. I think that, you know, Warner Brothers thought, well, why don't we just use the guy that's been doing it all this time? Yeah. But perseverance, um, keeping your skill set sharp, studying, working hard is there. Um, being grateful, all that good stuff. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you wear a lot of hats. I mean, in addition to being an amazing voice actor, <laughs> you are a casting director and a yeah. voice director. Um, I know you directed the series Get Blake because I yes. was in the pilot. <laughs> Although sadly, my character, oh, bye bye, James, my character got written out. Oh, but, yeah, that that was a really fun was, show was fun. to to direct. Um, we did fifty two episodes. It was a Nickelodeon show, and at that time, there was kind of a shake up at Nickelodeon, and it kind of didn't come back. And it sort of was a head scratcher. Everybody on it knew it was a funny show. I'm sure you can still find you know videos of them on Amazon or elsewhere. Um, really funny show. Really just a, a terrific, yeah. silly, oddball, quirky show. Um, How did and you I was... get started voice directing? Well, it's interesting on that particular show. Um, our mutual friend, Eric, from the Mr. Men show, um, was living in France and uh, running a, a company there, an animation company. And he reached out and said, would you want to audition for the show? And I said, yes. And then he said, would you be interested in directing the show? And I said, yes. That was the interview process. Uh, I wish life was always that easy. I ended up just being handed that show and one of the, oh. one of the leads in the show to, to do for all those episodes. Um, my real directors, and this is actually a short anecdote I do like to say, um, because I had been doing television and film, and I come from New York theater. You and I are both theater folk, I think. You're a theater person, aren't you? Plays? Uh, yes, I haven't done a play in a long time, but it's cut from the... It's, it's in there. Yeah, it's you in. went to Emerson, you did theater. Mm -hmm. um, so I went right to New York and did theater for 10 years, mm -hmm. and I, I was just a theater guy. And um, when I came out to L.A., it was to do, you know, a lot more film and TV. Voiceovers was always the sort of side thing I did. And I waffled in it and did mostly commercials and things. But um, I was hired to cast an anime show, a Gundam anime show. And what, in those days, we had... Were about? Was this was, when you were in New York? This was here. This it was here. here. Okay. It was, it was yeah. And... Um, in those days, they had live auditions. Now, boys and girls, a live audition is when you drive to a place, you pay for parking, you sit in a lobby until it's your turn to go in. You walk into a room where people scowl at you, you try to be funny, and then you go back to your car, hoping you didn't get a ticket and hoping you got the job. <laughs> but now we do auditions <laughs> from home. We record everything here, we send it in, and um, it's a completely different, different thing. So I was hired to cast this cartoon mm -hmm. and uh, I was sitting there watching actor after actor come in and the producers were in there with me and they said you know we really like the way you're directing these actors and getting these reads out of them their take two and take threes are unbelievable would you please submit your resume to direct this show I said absolutely hold on one second please let me just there you go and I handed them a, a blank piece of paper. I said, Here, here's my resume. Oh, let me just write my name on it. Here's my phone number. I was just being cute because there's no way I'm getting that job. And, um, and I got the job. You know, they, they, wow. liked, they saw I was dealing with the actors well and able to communicate what I think the essence of the scene or the line was about. And I think that's what they needed from a director. So that's so funny. Um, sometimes Jeff it's not about this, experience. Yeah. So Jeff on this thread was just saying that he's in one of the new Gundam shows, which is pretty ironic. Ah, oh, nice. Love that. But Welcome sorry, to the Gundam family, there, sir. 
sorry to interrupt your train so, of thought, but yeah. So, no, that was my, that was my first job. We did, um, 104 two full seasons of 104 episodes i was the sole director i sat in that room for a very very long time and because of that um some producers from sony asked me to direct uh a feature which was the biggest budget thing i've ever worked on in my still to date um there is a famous uh, your your fans will know about otomo who made the masterpiece akira uh, the first, the first uh, anime to ever win an Oscar back in the day, and this was his new movie. It was called Steam Boy, and it was sort of steampunk, very you know, fun action kind of stuff. And cool. in anime, it's fairly. Um, and it, it, they they said you can cast whoever you want, and I said, well, no, I mean it's anime. They said no, but it's Otomo. I said, well, I want the grandpa to be Sir Patrick Stewart. And they said, okay, but he's in London. You'd have to fly there to direct him. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I said, um, and for his son, I'd like Alfred Molina, but he's playing Tevia on Broadway right now. Well, you'd have to go stay in New York for a couple weeks. Would that be okay? I'm like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it was kind of crazy. And uh, my third role, I, I wanted to use Anna Paquin, who was here shooting a show in L.A. So I, I they just kind of, I spent a year flying around directing people. It was crazy for an anime movie. It's a fantastic, I think a very, very underrated movie. I'd be very curious to see if some of your podcast friends here, our, our, our Instagram TV friends, have ever seen Steam Boy. I know a lot of purists like to hear it in the original Japanese. Um, but this dub is so strong. The acting is so great. I urge you to maybe play with it and watch it in both languages, Steam Boy. Really kind of an underrated movie, I think. Okay, Wonderland viewers, we have homework this week. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you have any characters in that as well? I play the only non British character. It's it's they wanted like that it's a Britishy kind of movie. <laughs> um takes place in Manchester. And um but there is one nice role that they asked me to play, uh, which was just a blast. So I got to do that. You know, the only the only Americano. And just said you had Kari was in it, Kari Walgren? Yes, Kari was in it. Oh, we're looking things up. Yes, Kari. <laughs> and uh, great. It was a great cast. I mean, even all the other characters were populated by real stalwart people, if not, you know, famous celebrities. All amazing actors. Just some fantastic people. Wow. That's amazing. And so, yeah, you they also, speaking of Oscars, you not you directed the Chub Chubs, which was the Oscar winner for Best Animated Short Film. Um, the Chub Chubs, um, it's very funny. Um, a student of mine, I teach voiceover, if anybody ever needs to know that. Yes. Um, I had a student, that, <laughs> that doesn't matter, but I had a student who had this side gig working at Sony Imageworks doing special effects. And she, um, to be very clear, I did not direct it, but I did cast direct it. Okay. Um, okay. And um, so they were doing this, her team was doing the short video, the short film, and they asked me if I would cast the thing. I said, sure, I will, you know. And we held all kinds of auditions and we did this, we did this, we got it mostly populated, but there's one character that they couldn't, you know, do. And I said, I don't know why it's so hard. I can't find someone just to do, bup, 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 bup. and they said, you're going to play that role. <laughs> So I ended up playing four different voices in this thing, little ancillary characters. It's a really adorable little short. It did win the Oscar. I don't get a statue, but I get to talk about it here with you. Um, it was just kind of funny because it was this little little side hustle thing at, at, a, at a video effects company. And there wasn't a big budget. We didn't really pay much for the actors or the casting director. Um, <laughs> and uh, we just did it. And the next thing you know, my student is on stage getting an Oscar. It was very, very exciting. Wow. And what year was that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I should probably know that. A lot of years ago, in the early <laughs> 2000s, aughts, I guess people can look aughts. it up. Yeah, them. early aughts. Um, um, so, yeah, you mentioned that you also are a voice acting coach, and I know you do classes. How has um, COVID shifted um, that line of work for you? It has shifted it, you know, um, I've always loved teaching. Um, in another interview someday, we'll talk about the fact that I'm actually a math guy. I used to teach math as my side job when I lived in New York as a stage actor. I was a math tutor for like calculus. Yeah, 
those brain cells are gone. Uh, but I had them once upon a time. And I've always loved teaching. It's just something that makes me it's just very rewarding. Uh, it's one of the best parts of being a dad. Um, and I was that guy that was a camp counselor. I just loved working with people and teaching. And I started coaching actors more and more in New York and then here on mostly theatrical stuff, pilot season. I was very busy helping people prepare for auditions. And when I got more and more active uh, doing voiceovers, people would want me to give them sort of ongoing lessons. And it wasn't really a master plan. And suddenly I was doing so many of those. I said, I got to package you all into a single room and teach a class. And so this sort of idea of becoming a voiceover teacher mushroomed not out of a deep passion to be a voiceover teacher, but just a, it was this organic journey. Boy, has that been unbelievably rewarding. I've done it for 25 years. Um, and COVID has changed it only in that now I do it on Zoom. And now I can coach people out of LA. Those are calls I can't take. I do phone coaching. I do phone one-on-ones or Skypes. But now I can include those people in a group class where it's, you know, it's the Brady Bunch. It's the, it's the, it's the big, you know, grid of people. <laughs> But it works really well. Some people may opt when it's their turn to read to turn their video camera off so they can just feel like they're in a little cocoon like we are when we're in a booth. Um, but it's just as rewarding, just as much fun. I wasn't sure about it when this first happened. So I, I said yes to be a guest, like one night voiceover guide to other people's classes to see how I could do this whole thing. And I realized, um, it can be done very well. I'm having a blast doing it. I try to teach at least three times a year if I can. Uh, do you have any classes coming up? Um, I'm going to be doing one in January. I'm, right. I'm kind of down for the rest of the year, and I'll, I'll you know, do one again. Right. I find January is popular because um, it's that New Year's resolution in us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so people like, ah, it's a new year. 2020, 2020 was, yeah, it's all about 21. So, um, so yeah, people can always investigate strong. that. Well, yeah. how can um, people stay connected with you um, to, to find that information about your classes? Right. Um, they can email me. Um, they can write to just this general email I use is yellowbirdcasting. Okay. All one word, no dots, slashes, or underscores. Yellowbirdcasting at Yahoo. No shade about the Yahoo, please. <laughs> uh, I told you. We lost your audio. You still there, Rick? You I'm back. back. I'm sorry. I, I froze for a minute. I'm back. So yeah, Yellow Bird Casting at Yahoo if they want to write to me or ask any questions about anything I've covered, you know, with you guys today. Um, happy to talk about that. And I'm not here to pitch my classes. I'm here to share any info. No, no. But people about might be, stuff. we have aspiring voice actors and working voice actors on the stream. So nice. now that they know that, that that's something that you do and, and that they yeah. enjoy this, um, I'm also happy to share the information um, as well when you have it for the upcoming class. What are some like, tips that you give um, people that are looking to break into voice acting? Well, I give a lot of them, <laughs> six weeks worth, I hope. Um, but um, I'll give you one nugget because I, I do a lot of one night only, like a night of animation uh, technique or something. And mm -hmm. something I've called over a lot of years of casting cartoons and video games and, and all kinds of animated projects is there's this thought that character work is to take a wacky voice and to drape it over text. And you're doing character work. And, and when you hear all the auditions we have to sift through, yes, in animation, casting choices might be very, very voice specific. But like you even said about, you tapped into this thing about Spike, this little heart. Now, someone might not feel that it's palpably a heartful character, but I want, I want to get to know the inner core of the character they may have the most outrageous cartoony voice, but they're still some being, they're something, they're an entity that has emotions and fears and, and desires and all those things. So I, I bless that I come from acting because I'm not just this wacky voice guy. I, I didn't know any better when I started animation than to fill my characters with everything I would do with a character for stage production or for a film or for a television show. I need to know their backstory. I need to know, 
you know, why I'm walking on the stage at this moment. And if someone says, where are you coming from? I would know not to say, oh, stage left. No, I'm coming from the pub down the street. You know, <laughs> there's a life that we are looking in a keyhole through at this segment of that life. So I'd urge actors to think of not just being the goofy voice, but filling it organically with all of the stuff. It makes a very big difference. If you could hear auditions side by side by side, you'd start to go, oh, that's just a wacky voice. That's someone that's finding interesting peaks and valleys and shape and dimension to this audition of only a dozen lines. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I try to listen for when I'm casting. That's what I demand of my actors when I'm directing. And it's certainly what I try to propel in my own auditions. Yeah. That's, that's the big nugget for today. There you go, guys. Well, it makes a big difference. It really makes a very big difference. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have a question from the audience. Um, Tasker VO, uh, one of the most amazing trailer uh, voice actors out there, um, is asking, do you have any voices you do that you thought would book but have not booked? <laughs> We all have that that's one. hilarious <laughs> we all have that one um i i i maybe have used that voice but i i don't know you know we all have those i have a few that i've that i would like to use more gosh do i go through those now yeah um there's this character that i had toyed with um i think it was one of one of my i developed Did we lose you again? <laughs> that was like a scam call and it freezes you. I've got frozen, right? Okay. Um, I will answer that. And the other thing I'm going to bring up is because I have my external mic plugged into my yeah. phone and I'm running low on batteries, I may have to go to the regular terrible microphone in the phone so I can plug the phone in. Is that oh, okay? That's okay. I, All right. I, I meant know. swiftly because I do want to yeah. stay with you. You're what? Okay, I'm going to switch this yeah, out. I mean, Everyone talk amongst yourselves. And now I'm um, going to power up again. Not single. How's that? Can you hear me at all? Yeah, we can hear you great. Okay, to answer that question. Yeah, there's a character. You'll all, it's very derivative. You'll all know it, but I, I created it for the Mr. Men auditions uh -huh, way back uh -huh. in the day. And that was many years ago, I guess now. What did you say? It was like, what year? 20 years, years ago? 10 years ago? How many years ago? 12 years ago. Okay. I have no sense of time. I'm like a puppy. Um, and um, uh, it was sort of a derivative. It was sort of like if, um, uh, if, if Homer Simpson um, and Ted Knight from the Mary Tyler Moore show and um, Fred Flintstone, uh, all three had a love child. You know? you know, this kind of guy would come out. A little bit of Cliff Clavin in there. He's back in his throat. And this guy for the Mr. Men show was very military. And he had this kind of round voice. Very curt, you know. Anyway, I've wanted to use him forever. I've never been able to find exactly the right gig for him. Maybe someday. This might, who, who knows? This could be the week. You're a damn tootin'. I don't know. I'll find him. <laughs> um, I love doing voices that I can sustain for a long time because we all have done games where you're thrashing your vo voice and doing something that round. I just talk through all the air passages. You can do it all day, and there's no, no vocal threats. Anyway, That's sorry. So That's so good. Um, another question from the audience. Um, and this is, I think, a really good question. I should just make this one of my default questions. How much time do you spend on your reads, specifically animation games? You mean like for auditions? For auditions. Oh, my gosh. Um, are you well, like improv or are you? you know? I, I am... Um, You know what, Rick? Not hearing you. You're, I'm, now I hear you. One second. Okay. You know what? It says only 10% left, but I plugged it in. Hold on. Do you hear me? That's okay. You we hear have a few minutes, but okay. I'm hearing you. It'll, it'll be fine. Anyway. Um, be fine. I tend to do a lot of takes. I don't know if I'd give the, the advice, you know, like, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. I do a lot of yeah. takes. And I, and, and I do like to improv. So I turn the recording thing on and I just start going. And I don't, I don't realize I'm doing a bunch of takes. And then I've got this huge file that I have to like, do I like that take better or that take better? Um, so oh, no, I know, I don't worry. I will say, because I feel like that's my job, that is my job. If I'm not in a booth 
being paid to do the gig. My my job is to get the gig. And so if I over every take until <laughs> Ding, ding. And, and it it's a little obsessive. It's a little obsessive. But then I think I enjoy it. It's part of my job. Um, yes, I'm not caught up uh, with some of the shows I've taped, you know, Matlock, Alf. Um, I'm a little behind um, <laughs> with my TV viewing. Alf. But, um, you know, these people, I've watched every show the way, in Queen's Gambit. You know, the guy who created that show was the voice of Alf. Wow. See? Who knew? What a talent. That's that is amazing. Um, but I do, I do answer you the question. I do a lot of takes and I, um, uh, I, I think there's something organically great about rehearsing it a few times, leaving the window open for some improv stuff and just letting that organic thing comes out, come out. Cause after a lot of takes, you might lapse into a few things that sound a little bit rehearsed or whatever so i'm still learning believe me i'm still growing for so many years we got to go to our agent's office and audition there and you go into their booth and they would synergize with you and say try it again blah 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 well we're now in this bell jar where the actor the engineer the director where everybody rolled into one yeah and so that's part of the learning curve it's something that i've adopted into my teaching is self-direction mm -hmm. you know dealing with that obsession and, and to feel proud every time you hit the send button that audition's going out, you feel like I could be the one that gets that job. I feel good about that. Yeah. You know? Do you ever so take your Franken takes? Do you ever take it take part from one and part from another? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. I have many times. Uh because there might be, you know, a chunk of one longer speech I liked, but I ended it better on another one. And I'll, I'll, I'll clip them together. That's the wizardry of, of whatever program you're using. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, Red Striker, Alf was the show that was on in the 80s. Might be before your time. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, my. Wow. Um, I know. Well, we, we just about have to wrap it up here. But if there's any more um, last questions, um, somebody was asking, do you know, have Tom and Jerry ever talked in the series? Tom and Jerry um, don't don't ever speak. They make vocal reactions if they sit on like a hot fire. There was, I think, one word that Tom was meant to yelp quite loudly as sort of a, a funny joke because he never did speak um, in one an older episode. But they don't ever speak. It's just all of the guest cast and all the ancillary characters that you and I have played. Um, those are the ones that that speak in English. What what were some shows cartoons that you watched as a kid? Did was there anything that really inspired you? Oh, I grew up, you know, back, I'm going to date myself. It was all the Hanna-Barbera, it was the Flintstones, and it was, it was all, all those great shows. I was, you know, much more of a comedy guy than an action guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, while my friends were playing with like G.I. Joes, I invented characters named G.I. Stink. Um, I, I just, I would just always go to the funny stuff and do like, you know, Mr. Sweaty or whatever. Um, <laughs> so I watched, yeah, I watched all those shows. We sat through them relentlessly, you know. And how do you stay inspired now? Where, how do you find, how do you find your funny bone, especially in times like 2020, where there's <laughs> been a lot of dark times? Well, um, wow, it's a great question. How do I stay inspired? Um, well, showbiz is a funny thing um, because you go into it because you love the craft and you like to tell stories and you like to create. And then you take classes and you are in this, this world of creative stuff. So I'm drawn to the creative spirit that I love to tell stories in possibly a goofy way, but I do love doing things that also um, uh, make people think or learn or grow in some way. I mean, I do a lot of comedies, but I run to projects where there's something that has some depth and meaning and will will help do a small part to, you know, make some change. Um, and then you wedge this thing in the business part of it. Like, I've got to make a living at it. And then it brings a whole different component of, you know, the old adage, there are two words in show business and art isn't one of them. Um, and you go, wait a minute, I'm here in LA. I've, I've spent my life savings to get here. I have to make a go of this. And so it brings a different color of desperation and drive. And I deserve this and I need this and I've got to do this and my rents do. 
Um, inspiration for me is always remembering, and I've been blessed to make my living at this, so I'm not saying it's not about the business, but remembering why I do this, remembering why I came here, remembering why I gravitated toward this. Um, and I think for me, it's, it's largely that simple. I also, I think I look at life through a kind of a, a cockeyed prism. Like I think things are funny and um, <laughs> I'm kind of a goofball. My house is a very funny place. My daughter is hilarious. My wife is sarcastic and funny. It's a really sitcom -y house. Mm -hmm. um, so thankfully I find inspiration fairly easy to come by. Um, and if anything, when you bring up 2020, I think I'm even more inspired because I need that to buoy, to, to write everything. There's so much out there that is sad and angry and desperate. Um, and we all grapple with those the best way we can. And for me, um, I think one of my therapies is to embrace my creativity, to lock myself in there and obsess over the auditions because honestly, that makes me happy. Mm -hmm. But then I'll jump on the piano and my daughter and I will write the stupidest musical ever written, so. Oh my God, will you please come back for that? <laughs> yes, Vicky we have these Hayden crazy Hayden. ideas for musicals. The stupidest miracle ever written. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you so much, Rick, for joining us today. Um, Thanks for having and me. And thank you everybody that tuned in today. I know um, there's been a lot of people that have been on here right since the very start. So thank you for watching. Um, Rick is on Instagram. You can follow his profile for more info and Google Bug Snacks for that. Um, yeah. For anybody, I think it's just I think my Instagram not so active is just Rick Z Voiceovers. Yeah. If that's how you want and to find me, they can find you right through this link too. That's right. I knew that. Of course. And, um, so in the Bug Snacks, you can Google for that, and then yeah. send Rick an email if you want to get on his list for upcoming voiceover classes. And for anybody yes. that may have come over from Rick's side, if you are digging the show, feel free to subscribe. Next week, our guest is Debbie Derryberry. She's a longtime voice wow. actor. She's on F is, F is for Family. Um, she is the voice of Jimmy Neutron, as well as a billion other things. Um, so stay tuned for that. And um, you can also send this to anybody that is an animation or video game fan that you think might enjoy as well, um, or to watch the replay. So thanks, yeah. Rick. Tell Katie I said hi. I most certainly will. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for inviting me. And I want to thank all the people who have stuck with this uh, little hour with us uh, for staying tuned. Hopefully you learned something or you were entertained. Um, this is a, a great a great thing uh, that you do, Allison, and thank you for having me. For those of you who uh, are thinking of pursuing this, stick with it. Um, you have that lady right there who works really hard at it. Oh, we're gonna, let's do a high five. Kink, 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 kink. I don't bend that way. Uh, <laughs> uh, but stick with it, everybody. Uh, may the wind be at your back and may the mic be at your front and uh, may all good things happen. Aw, thanks guys. We'll see you next week. Have a great night. Bye.